What I'm going to talk about tonight, though, is perhaps um, not a very endearing thing for Christmas, because it's really about how a global problem has been creeping along, malnutrition, uh, to the point where it's become almost of epidemic proportions. It is really one of the most pervasive and insidious aspects of poverty. Um, it is, as I say, a colossal and it is a universal problem. One in three people on the planet today are affected by some form of malnutrition. It creeps across communities. Uh, it's literally part of the set of all the general issues that we discuss every day, whether it's to do with social development, uh, our economic development, and I'll talk a lot about the impacts of malnutrition on just that, but it starts to really impact on sustainability and then ultimately on what we consider to be the ingredients of a peaceful society. So at one extreme, of course, malnutrition is all about life and death, but it has a long tail. In other words, this long-term impact is there for many generations and it will continue to come back up onto the table as we see some of the things that are going to happen uh, in the future as a result of what we're seeing today within the, 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 the population of children. The figures are pretty horrendous. So if we look at this map, the hunger map, for last year, yes, it, it's a static picture, but one of, the, and one of the challenges, of course, is that there are many countries for which they're teetering on the brink of going into very, very extreme conditions. So if we take Africa, for example, you'll see that Kenya, on the average for last year, is sitting at round about moderately high, 15 to 25 percent. But we know that in the last few months, malnutrition has shot up as a result of drought. And in many parts, you're looking at levels as high as 48 percent. So these figures are a snapshot, but they can certainly change. And obviously, we can see in some of the African countries around the Horn of Africa, but even in the north, we simply don't have any data. So on the one hand, we might be surprised uh, to look at the Russian Federation and see that there are low levels because we do know that there are pockets of malnutrition everywhere. So really, this is what I would call the, the, the most modest description of malnutrition that we could possibly have. So these are some of the shocking statistics. And, I, and I, 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 I use that word advisedly because every time I read them and I think about them, I, I find them really quite, I'm dismayed by them. Given all of the money and the attention that we try to put in to the World Food Programme and many others, it just feels like we're not making any inroads. So, you know, nearly 46% of deaths in children under five are attributable to undernutrition. It's not a kind of one-to-one -one mapping, but the numbers are certainly there for scrutiny. So we're talking about nearly three million young people a year. But once you start to come away from death and you really start to think very clearly about all of the other attributes, severe acute malnutrition, then the numbers just literally go up. So you've got 20 million children suffering from acute malnutrition, 160 million children suffering from stunting. Um, and these are the ones that we can get to, to actually measure to the communities where we can get in and see what's happening. And the genuine problem is that once a child is malnourished, it opens them up to obviously many other problems. It has to do with resistance to infections, they could be in malaria regions, and, and so on and so forth. So that and including non-communicable diseases will sometimes take children way over the brink. So you have diarrheal diseases, uh, respiratory infections, and so forth. And those who survive carry that hallmark, that legacy, through their lives, particularly if there have been no interventions. And we'll come back to what those interventions really are and whether they can be seen to be effective. So we can genuinely then take stock of where we see those deaths actually happening. And as you might expect, of course, sub-Saharan Africa stands out. But there are other countries that are genuinely also struggling. So parts of Latin America, um, all through Asia, and so forth. So it's not an even playing field. We know that. Um, 
but the prevalence issue is also bound up with many other conditions and many other factors. So when we think about stunted children, we have a, a series of targets, for example, that the World Health Organization has set up. And we have some trends, and these are the trends that we need to kind of keep our eye on. So we think that stunting is already at too high a level, but the current trends would take us up to something like 125 million within the next seven years. The target that the WHO has set is 100 million. So they're seeing it come down from 160 down to 100, but we're, not, we're just not making enough progress. Similarly for wasting, the idea is to get wasting down to a global target of 5% by 2025, and right now the trend is going to take us somewhere near to 40%. So literally, we're, we're just not making the kind of progress, and it's not for want of money. In many cases, a lot of money is actually being spent. The other side of the coin is to do with the maternal health. We have tremendous difficulty in many places of dealing with anemia. Um, there are many women who have anemia. We think that women in reproductive age, uh, currently it's nearly 30% are anemic. That absolutely goes across the world. You don't have to be in a developing country to suffer from anemia. But the target is 15%. And again, it leads to persistent low birth rates, uh, birth weights. It leads to reductions of many, many uh, of the kind of functioning uh, capacities of children and of their mothers. Breastfeeding can obviously compensate for that. And here's the other side. We have uh, the WHO looking and seeking for a target of something close to 40%, 50%, but we will fall short of that, short of that as well. So between maternal education, between low birth weight, and then all the things that come along with malnutrition, it's almost as if we're setting ourselves up for a long tail of intergenerational problems. It doesn't just stop at the moment when the one child grows up. And then we have the other problem, which is at the other scale uh, of malnutrition, the sort of double burden, as we call it, where we have children who are obese, and in many instances, we're seeing a sort of combination of the two. So let's just think about what is malnutrition then. We have got these two ends of malnutrition. So it's really about an excess or an imbalance of the kinds of nutrition, protein, carbohydrates that children are, particularly children, are looked at. So we have undernutrition, which is, of course, characterized by literally a lack of energy and food. So we have stunting, we have wasting, uh, we have micronutrient deficiencies, many things that go into that package. And then, as I say, we have overweight, obesity, and a whole bunch of diet-related non-communicable diseases, heart disease, stroke, diabetes, and so forth. And this double burden, we've noticed, actually begins to occur in many places. Now, why is that? Well, it has to do with something around how children come along. So very, very typically, a mother will have her first or second child or first child to begin with. And then what will happen is another child will come along. So the first child is, so to speak, taken off the breast and then given, in many cases, pure carbohydrates. And that child then starts to go down another de developmental um, uh, pathway. So what you begin to see are these two types of malnutrition. And on the right-hand side, we see a child suffering from what's called marasmus. It looks shocking. I mean, you know, when I first arrived in the village where I live, there were children who looked like this. Um, they're little pot bellies, they're skinny, they, they have hair that's sort of pigmented and variegated, their skin is hanging off, they've got almost feels like burns. Um, they, they, they literally, um, they're, they're very irritable, they don't have an appetite and so forth. And on the right hand, on the left hand side, you see children that are somewhat, they look somewhat better, the Kwashiorkor condition. And, and unfortunately, the children on the left hand side are far, far less able to, so to speak, come back from the condition they're in. They're edemas, they, they, they literally are almost, um, they're suffering from a, a lack of absorption, they have a damaged absorption capacity. And so whilst they look 
to the outside as if they are okay. They actually are losing muscular mass. They have an edema. They have a lot of immunodeficiency problems. They have vomiting, infections, diarrhea, and so forth. Now, I put these two pictures up because often when you see pictures in the press and you look at famine and drought and so on, and the one that's just happening now, and we will have another El Nino next year, so it is very likely, unless there are different kinds of interventions, that once again, we will have many, many children who begin to look like one of these two categories. The Kwashikor is really because of a lack of protein in the diet, whereas the child on the right with Merasmus is essentially a child that has had just insufficient food, insufficient nutrition. Kwashiorkor, by the way, comes from an African term meaning the first, second child. So this is the condition that is very typical of the baby that has been taken off the breast and starts to feed on solids when the new baby comes along. What a lot of research has done now, though, is to look at the conditions under where these two, two types are found and started to really understand over a, a long period that this is really where the impacts are felt, and that is in the development in the first 1,000 days, including pregnancy, of executive uh, skills, your executive development. It's part of cognitive development, part of, part of the cognitive behavior. And there's a whole suite of executive powers that are developing as these children, at this particular stage in their life, are beginning to grow. So let's just take a, a look at what today happens. In the kind of industrialized thinking, we will take packets of food, RTUF. These are sort of ready-to-use therapeutic foods that can be delivered into the field. Uh, we have the World Food Program delivering sacks of rice and many other things, sort of directly into communities that are suffering under an emergency from a lack of food. And that could be because of floods, because of droughts, and so forth. In the traditional setting, um, you'll see then that plants and many other forms are substituted in. When there's no access to the World Food Programme or there's no access to any emergency care, a lot of populations go out into, in a sense, their indigenous biodiversity and start harvesting that. The question really comes, though, how long can you sustain this kind of feeding? And is it actually going to help the two kinds of conditions that we see? Well, it turns out that it's not as effective as one would have hoped. So in the case of the Kwashikor and the Marasmus, what you try to do in the case of very small children, is you have to be very, very careful. Of course, if you have a marasmus child, what you want to do is give them some vitamins, of course, but a very nutritious diet. But for the kwashiorkor children, you need to have a lot of calories coming from protein and from fat. You need to kind of rebalance them. Because what they're, what's actually happening inside them is they're kind of melting down. Their organs are beginning to collapse. Whereas the marasmus child, although they look shocking, in a sense, they have a perfectly balanced metabolism, but just not enough food in total going into the body. And when we look at traditional diets, what we see is that even though the scale, the number of calories is very small, they're often offered a very balanced diet, which in a sense sustains them and keeps them going. So what happens to a child's brain? And I think this is something that you know, one could spend many, many, many years studying how the brain develops. But in its most extreme, I think this is perhaps where the story of malnutrition really needs to start. So in the top two pictures, we see the MRIs, the magnetic resonance scanning from two children. They're, it's a 10-month-old patient. And what you see are many, many areas where the ventricles are not filling out the whole space. So you can see that there's a lot of dark areas intruding into the top two images. If you go to the bottom, you actually see that the brain is starting to fill out into the cavity. And what this essentially shows in a very simplistic way is a child that has had a food intervention. In other words, its brain was able to recover. Now, this is obviously very, very good news 
Particularly, we see in some of the studies that if this happens within the thousand days, that those children who have been malnourished at the very beginning can get to a point where they're almost performing as well in terms of their cognitive development as if they never had been exposed or they never had had any stunting or wasting. So that's, that's really you know, the best news possible. But for those children who don't get that intervention, we're really left with quite a dilemma. Because in a sense, it's, it's impossible to imagine this to be a lost cause. But what you see then is those children as I mentioned before, start to open up to many other problems. So a lot of them will get um, a kind of... Um, uh, they'll, they'll take on, if they're not in a very clean environment, they'll begin to fall prey to different kinds of infections, fecal coliforms, so kind of enteric diseases and so forth. Now, what a lot of the development world has done is to focus on precisely giving clean water, sanitation, washing hands. But more recently it's become very apparent that even as you're moving into the middle-income countries where you're, you have a modicum of sanitation and reasonably good food, but still not enough to avoid what one calls malnutrition, still children are dying. And the question is, why? What is it that makes it impossible for, in a sense, a child to be able to grow properly and to have a proper vital life? So it's much more complicated than just simply saying you give food to the child and you make sure that they have vitamins and proteins. In fact, it turns out that you have to have a very high quality of housing, piped water, good sanitation, good education, because every single part of this all fits together along with a nutritious diet. And so the MRC, the Medical Research Council in Gambia, did a very, very sort of interesting experiment. They took the entire population in their research station, that included the doctors, the, 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 all the trained staff, together with the villagers. And so they had a whole range of housing. They had a whole range of diets. And then they had sort of people who were kind of halfway in the middle between sort of the mud huts and between the sort of what I would call the very high quality housing and the type of food and the sanitation. And of course what they found was that the children who had very good housing, uh, safe and secure, had good food and were educated, essentially performed as per the best kind of uh, curves that you could imagine and all the kind of cognitive development. The interesting ones were the ones in the middle where they had suitable accommodation but were really unable to utilize the very best of it. And so they actually fell below the curve for some of the development as well. So this is what get the, gave the Medical Research Council the idea that there's a threshold of housing, there's a threshold of sanitation, there's a threshold of what you need to enable children to grow properly and to essentially reach their best potential. Now, there's some other things that happen with children who are malnourished. There's a lot of evidence to show that children who are brought up in multilingual households actually do very well because they develop a lot of neural pathways, they essentially enhance a lot of their abilities. But if you have a child that's already stressed, essentially with a brain development that's already not doing as well as, as its um, uh, uh, counterparts, and then you put that child into a multilingual environment, what you see is that they fall back even further. It's almost as if the extra stresses on those individual children is just too much. So when you think about refugee camps and you think about where we're putting a lot of children, those who are moving, those who are migrating, and I'll come back to that at the end about uh, climate change, we see a lot of children are exposed in the first instance to the stresses of moving, particularly when they're little. Uh, they're in poor housing, poor sanitation, they're probably in a multilingual environment because they're moving around. And then you can't guarantee that they will have sufficient food. So they've got sort of multiple things happening against them as opposed to just simply it being enough food. So when you see children in the refugee camps and you see that they're suffering because they don't have enough food, there's, there are many, many other things that are happening to their brains. One of the first things that 
you can guarantee with children who are malnourished is that the hippocampus itself, and I'll come to what that is, it's part of the limbic system, is really not developing. Now, this is not a problem that's just restricted to the developing world. There's a number of studies that show, and this is just one example uh, from uh, Washington, where researchers found that when you, found, when you have children with very poor parents and with poor parenting skills, again, all those attributes that we were talking about, then you also see that they have a smaller hippocampus. So please don't think that this is just a problem of the developing world. This is creeping up the agenda. And although we don't have very good figures uh, or explicit figures on malnutrition for London, what we do know is that there are pockets across East London where malnutrition and other problems do exist. But it's compounded by the fact that the quality of housing and potentially some of the educational issues that go around that, are part of the problem. They're not something separate. So let's, just, let's go to the limbic system itself. So this is a small cartoon, um, because I'm never quite sure whether people want to see pictures of brains. So this is a cartoon of a brain. And just to kind of orientate you, uh, the, the long gray part that's coming down is the, is the uh, stem, uh, going down the spinal column. If you can imagine that facing out to you are the eyes and the face, so this is the part of the brain going backwards. And so what you have are four major parts. You have the hypothalamus. Um, it's like, uh, let me do it in layers. So we have the, sorry, we have the thalamus. Underneath that we have the hypothalamus, a very small part, represents about 1% of the, of the brain. The amygdala, the two purple colored uh, pieces, so the blobs there and then the hippocampus. So let me just quickly kind of rehearse what all of these parts of your brain do, and you'll begin to understand why any part of it is important, but there are some that are even more critical. So the thalamus is like a, a relay station. All of the senses, except for smell, get translated through this relay station, and essentially that's your emotional package. And, and interestingly, smell and you know sometimes when you smell something, it gets very, very close to a deep, a deep emotion comes out of you. And that's because it doesn't go through the relay system. It goes straight into, the, it goes straight into your brain, all right? So that's why smell is rather, rather special. So the thalamus is, is a, relay, a relay system. Then you have, uh, let's go to the amygdala. Now, the amygdala is really important. It's the thing that really controls how you seem to the outside world. If, you have, if, it's, if it's prodded in a positive way, so to speak, um, you can generate fear and anger and violence. All right? But if you were to remove or to essentially um, not have a well-developed amygdala, you would see people who are mellow. There's this condition, the kluver busi, and you've got then the equivalence of if you go out and drink alcohol, for example. You get hyperorality, hypersexuality, a kind of disinhibited behavior. All right, so that's what your amygdala is doing. Now we'll go over to the hypothalamus, and that's pretty much controlling the whole of the autonomous nervous system. It's bringing it all together. It's making it coherent. And it's making you the kind of emotional package that you really are. But the hippocampus is probably the most interesting when it comes to executive powers and, and the cognitive development. Now, why is that? Well, it's the place where your short-term memories come in and essentially get turned into the long-term memories. So when you're, let's say you're in a crowd of people and the way in which you're going to interact with them, it's as much about your understanding of their experience as it is of your own experience. So I want you to hold in your mind this idea of being in a crowd. It's, it's rather important. So there's a very, very, very good study called the Young Lives Study. And the, the researchers looked at many hundreds of children in Ethiopia, Peru, India, and Kenya. And they looked at this cohort across multiple age classes, going from age one all the way through. The first thing you find, of course, is the big educational differences in the parents and the maternal education. And then you, you measure something called the height for age score, the HAS score. Now, in the first year, 
nearly all of these children, you could see that there was a positive association between how this height um, for age and cognitive development go along. So in sort of year one, what you'll have are children who are beginning, in a sense, to develop concepts of familiar faces. They understand the stranger. Uh, so, th so they're really beginning to see how the world is operating around them. But as the children were growing through these different age classes, what they found was that the most fundamental differences were occurring in these first 1,000 days. Afterwards, it was all about linear growth, regardless of where they were, and that actually the height for age score at one was positively associated with basically all their cognition and school performance thereafter. So those first 1,000 days really set the scene for the rest of these children's lives. And more importantly, it, it sort of led to everything, their cognitive outcomes. Um, if you prevented stunting during infancy by some interventions, those children would eventually do almost as well as children who had never had any stunting. But nevertheless, the thousand days is the window of opportunity. Now, the... the I guess the difficulty is that sometimes people don't realise how quickly children's development is going on. Um, as I said, in the first year, you're already seeing the ability for some of these executive powers to start taking hold. And let's just, I'll just go through them. So response inhibition, as I said, this idea of the stranger danger. Even a very small child is able to understand that. They'll recognise a face, for example. They've got a working memory. So babies who are just six months old have a working memory. So they can store information, they can retrieve it when they see a face, and they, they sort of know what to do. They remember favourite toys, for example. So you can see already there's a strong cognitive skill that's, that's present. And then gradually you see this emotional control building up. So although the very young ones don't have it, you can see it developing very, very quickly. So by the time they're one and two years old, you have already the possibility of emotional control. They have attention. So children, even at that stage, have attention. And if you've watched a small child, even a one-year-old, they can actually look at something for a very, very long time, almost transfixed by it. But as children go through and come out of the 1,000 days, that's when flexibility starts to really take root. And so you have this combination of the working memory, the emotional control, the attention, and the flexibility is how it all gets packaged together. Now, let's go up to the limbic system and imagine that those cavities, those gaps in the brain, were not well developed and that the hippocampus itself was very small in comparison to um, age, the age cohort. So when we see that those undeveloped areas are left unchanged, you can imagine that that complex setting between the endocrine, the hormonal controls of the hypothalamus, how the limbic system and the, all of the sensory relays are operating, and then all of this role over the behaviours, all of these elements are essentially at risk. So the hippocampus, then, is rather an interesting part of the brain because, yes, it talks about memories, but memories have this unique feature of self-referencing. So when you lay down your, your memories, your short-term memory, and they eventually become long-term memories, it gives you a self-referencing process. So what that means is that when I see someone going through a whole range of emotions, I kind of reference them back to myself. So that's what the self-referencing means. And so essentially, when others have got things going on, there are accomplishments, positive, negative, Everything's coming back to me. It's all self-referencing back to me. And whether I'm delighted by somebody or not has to do very much with my long, and, and let's say very long in my case, experience of many things that have gone on. Now, if you look at these causality maps, you can see the little coloured areas. So it's just to tell you, essentially, this is where it's all sort of happening in the hippocampus. Um, so imagine... When you have a child that has had malnutrition during its early stages of growing up in the first 1,000 days, um, these are the parts of the brain that essentially are affected and light up in this case in terms of what we're showing, admiration for a virtue. 
compassion for social pain. So your brain is actually reflecting your own self-referencing, your own memories, and then giving you the cognitive skills, the executive skills, to be able to respond in a way which is flexible, controlled, and so on. So the hypothesis that I will put to you then is that if the brain doesn't have the same capacity, in other words, it is damaged, it is slightly incapacitated, all the way through to being very incapacitated, and then you find yourself in a crowd of young people, an angry mob, a group of people who were malnourished at birth, you may not get the reaction that you expect. You may very well get people who react very violently. And in conversations with a lot of political leaders and, and so forth, I've often said, do you actually really think that these young men and women, often men, out in the streets with sticks, are there for the political ideology? No, of course they're not. They're there often because they've got swept up in a way where they can't relate to the social dynamic that's going on around them. They'd have no self-referencing. And so the, the sort of the sad thing is that you have a young generation of people who've gone through enormous troubles in many cases, particularly in Africa, where they've been displaced, they've often migrated or they've become migrants. They have a very unstable or very insecure food basis as they've been growing up. They might even be the second baby, the kwashikor. Um, they don't live in a setting which has got stable sanitation or housing. And so there's a whole litany of things. And so when we actually have been able to look at the MRI of some adolescents, we see the hallmarks of early onset or very early malnutrition. So you carry this with you if you're a young person in those sorts of circumstances. That's quite a that's quite an indictment, I would say, and a very, very difficult situation because what are you to do? Well, if you're the World Bank, what you do is you think about, well, what should we spend our money on? And what's our good benefits and yields and return on investments, the social return, the social investment? And it turns out that, in fact, you could spend very little money and get an enormous financial benefit back. So just from that perspective, the financial return, the numbers begin to stack up. So if you look at the kinds of targets that I was talking about earlier, the stunting, the wasting, the breastfeeding and anemia, tackling those, you know, so effectively putting money on the table for women's health, for children's health, for their nutritional status. And now let's add sanitation, housing and so forth. You will undoubtedly affect cognitive development. You will quickly affect their learning abilities, ultimately their productivity as adults, which will lead to wages and so forth. So using that calculus, very, very simple calculus, you get these kinds of figures where, you know, you invest a very small amount of money and you get an enormous amount out because it's such a simple thing to affect children in those first thousand days is one of the most, let's put it this way, uh, valuable investment that you could make in the human population. And the bank itself recognizes it. Their frustration is, though, that these directed programs just on food simply aren't as effective as one would imagine. Even if you go single micronutrient by micronutrient, that doesn't seem to work either. It seems to be that it's the whole picture in which a child is brought up. So we can, we can fix things, we can send food in, we can try to do lots of education. But this is a, a genuine, integrated, sustainable development problem that requires multiple, multiple actions. And then we have the kind of disturbing fact, well, perhaps it is too late for some of these young people, that, that you never really can rebuild what's been lost. So you might find yourself in any part of the world surrounded by hundreds of young people who literally have been set back. You know, they're at the bottom of the, they're at the bottom rung of a ladder of development. And so we've been asking the question, well, would it be possible to use artificial intelligence, 
and deep learning algorithms to try to see if there were non-intervention but educational processes that could stimulate the brain with, let's say, a very intensive nutritional and uh, security package around an individual to try to build back in the convolutions that were lost as those children were being brought up. And that remains a, an outstanding question. And of course, it's, it has many ethical dimensions. You know, do you intervene with young people, young adolescents, who maybe seem to be getting on all right, but their level of compensation has got limits? You can't simply turn someone into a well-functioning adult if they don't have the constraints or the emotional ability to participate in society at large. So let's, let's end by saying it is really an environmental issue as well. Um, many of you will know that there's a negotiation going on in Poland at the moment on climate change. And one of, the, one of the escalators, because climate is genuinely a threat multiplier, is how many people are put on the move because of climate change. So right now we have about 65 million people who are internally displaced to Peru who can genuinely be attributed to having had to move because of climate change. And that's because either the drought has hit, crops have failed, water has failed, or there's been a flood, whatever. And obviously we come back to the same kind of map, and this just goes endlessly round and round and round. So what can one actually do to avoid people having to move all the time? Well, there's clearly things you can do on the ground. There are localized issues that can be identified ahead of time, planting trees, making sure there's sufficient water and energy and so forth. But the kind of climate change that we're seeing now, for example, in Eastern Africa, is it's sort of extraordinary. So we know there's an El Nino coming. And in the past, that would have meant a long drought. But if I tell you it hasn't actually rained in the Rift Valley since June, you can imagine what the state of the cattle are. You can imagine what the state of the grass is. You can imagine what the state of the populations are. But this is not yet declared to be any kind of disaster. And literally what happens is people just knuckle down and take their rations down with them. They move into different kinds of food. Uh, they eat very little. They drink water. They have a few plants. And occasionally, they'll slaughter a cow. But even then, the cows are just skin and bones, and similarly, the goats and the sheep. And that's actually what people have done in the past. They've essentially just, as you might say, straightened their belt and, and sort of think, well, the, the, the rains will come. But if there's an El Nino next year, the rains aren't going to come. They're not going to come in the way they did. There may be a couple of days of rain in the, in the January period, but it's very unlikely that we will see rains now, maybe for even another year. So what's the government doing? Right. Well, not a lot, but anyway, I'm sure they'll get the message. And so the question then is, is this the moment when you say, we have to stop just delivering vast amounts of food that, in a sense, isn't going to sustain not just the population, but young children who are essentially at risk of malnutrition. We need to rethink the whole way in which we take populations forward. So the first thing is you see that actually even when there is a drought and even when there are floods, there are quite often very small pockets of food production. But they get swept aside in the whole development and the whole kind of emergency response. And I've seen it happen again and again where the small holders, the little kind of farms here, there, and everywhere, which are actually able to produce just about enough food to keep many people going, are essentially put to one side, and an industrial process starts over here. So last year, um, there was an experiment done. It was done in Isiola. And what they, what they did was they put malnutrition, they put children at the core, and they and when I say they, it was the Red Cross and it was all the international organizations. And they came together and they said, OK, so how could we take children and the whole population through a drought in such a way that it's not about putting rice on the table or some kind of carbohydrate just to fill up the stomachs, but to put a nutritious diet 
And what came out of it was quite extraordinary. First of all, it was one of the biggest and most immediate uses of blockchain. What they did was they gave to every person who could come with an ID, they gave them directly the funds. And what they could do with those funds then was entirely up to them. They could go and buy food locally. They could buy small amounts, but of highly nutritious food. So they tested all the children as soon as they realized there was going to be uh, problems in terms of not enough food and a drought and so forth. And the population had at that point something in the order of, I think it was 38% malnutrition. You go all the way through the drought, you come out the other side, the parents have been receiving money in this way, and then you go back to this population that effectively has had no food put into the system, no, no big sacks of rice arriving from the World Food Program. And you look at the population, you measure them again, you look at all the children, and the malnutrition has gone down to 32%. So in the interviews that were done, it became extremely clear that people were absolutely able to moderate, to use wild, wild plants, wild food sources, and to mix that with small amounts of food that were grown in the smallholders with the small amount of water that they had, but to put together a highly, highly nutritious diet. And I think that's really something that we should not forget, that in the case of climate change, as plants are adapting and many other things are happening, there is still the possibility of local knowledge of being able to derive food locally that is highly nutritious. And that is really the key to, I think, our survival, that we sustain our knowledge of what is nutritious as opposed to what just simply fills our stomachs with calories. Because as we know, malnutrition on the obesity side is beginning to grow. And that is just simply about calories going in. It's got nothing to do with the quality of the food. In fact, it's quite the opposite. So the whole strategy that's being debated in Paris has underneath it an underbelly of how do you bring the human population through these extremes that are going to be happening and so that we don't have the catastrophes of droughts and people simply dying in the face of that. And so when I look at this um, picture, this is, this is Kenya, and you can see that vegetation and density losses and that all those yellow parts are where the, essentially the vegetation density due to either fires or, or aridity are going to be sweeping through most of the Rift Valley. Then you can see that the population that's going to be affected in Kenya alone is in the order of 30 million people. So we have to do something different. You cannot simply deliver a lot of sacks of rice to 30 million people. And hence, we're now seriously looking all the way through East Africa, but then further up into the, uh, into the Horn of Africa, as to a very different way of thinking about aid and of development. And if there's one thing that I would say to you is, at this stage, um, we can't afford to have a huge number of young people, and the next generation, in other words, have malnutrition as the hallmark of their adolescent behavior. And that's what we will do if we continue to have the same kind of development model, which takes the environment as an externality and simply responds by pouring inappropriate amounts of food of the wrong kind into local populations, who could, if given small amounts of financing and resourcing, feed themselves very, very well. So I will leave that with you because this, in a sense, becomes the map that we have to make a decision on. If you allow the system to run as it currently does, and looking at the behavioral prototyping that we've seen and the kinds of impacts of, our, of malnutrition, and where people will be moving because of climate change, the internal migration, and then the migration across Africa into Europe, essentially moving all around the world, you're going to have millions of young people who will be essentially on your doorstep, in our homes, in our environments, who need special attention because for no fault of their own, they did not get the possibility of a full, mal uh, a full nutritional 
um, 1,000 days at the beginning of their life, which gives them the full spectrum of executive skills and cognitive development. And so, uh, in a rather controversial way, I'll leave this slide. Um, you could have the map of happiness or prosperity if we pay attention to malnutrition as a long-term intergenerational problem. Or you could start to badge people because of where they've come from, not truly understanding that it's not the colour of their skin, it's not the language they speak, it's the fact that they never actually had a good start in life because of malnutrition. Thank you.